This is Haiti. And this is how rich cruise ship tourists, the relatively few who visit, get to see it. At a private beach on the northern coast. And this is the reality, just a few kilometers away in the capital, Port-au-Prince, for most people in Haiti. Violent gangs are in control of the streets, skyrocketing prices for food mean most people are hungry and miserable. At the moment where I talk to you, there are two more. This is Jean-Samuel Mentor. He is a freelance journalist from Haiti. Je ne trouve pas vraiment de mots pour décrire la situation que nous vivons actuellement. Les violences sont aggravées et les cas de kidnapping sont explosés en Haïti. But did you know the start of Haiti's story is quite inspirational? It had the world's only successful slave revolt, leading to the world's first black republic. So what happened? Let's just say colonialism played its part, and all these big players, amongst others, were involved. So let's unravel how the world messed with Haiti and what that means for today. This is Haiti's flag now. This is what it used to be when it was still called Saint-Domingue. Yes, that's the French flag. When the black slaves broke free of their French masters, they removed the white stripe from their flag, representing an end to white European power. A bit of white later reappeared in the flag, but with Haitian symbols. But let's start at the beginning, or at least what Europeans consider the beginning of Haiti. It was actually Christopher Columbus who was the first colonial player to set foot on the island of La Hispaniola. He landed in what is now called Mont Saint-Nicolas on November 6, 1492, claiming it for Spain. At the time, half a million indigenous people were living on the island. By the mid-17th century, most of those indigenous people were gone. Europe was crazy for coffee and sugar, and this Caribbean island promised both. France fought Spain for control. The two colonial powers ended up splitting the island in two. The Spanish colony of Santo Domingo is today the Dominican Republic. And the French Saint-Domingue later became Haiti. The French brought in African slaves for the grueling work on sugarcane plantations. By 1800, Haiti had a population of more than 700,000, overwhelmingly people from West Africa. That was a very uh, uh, it was kind of a barbarian system. Slaves worked, they were beaten, etc. Robert Fatten is a professor of politics at the University of Virginia. Born and raised in Port-au-Prince, Haiti has been at the center of his research for decades. The exploitation of slaves was lucrative. Saint-Domingue became France's most profitable colony in the Americas. Slave labor plantations supplied roughly 40% of sugar imported to Europe at the time. It was a brutal system, both for the enslaved humans, as well as the ecosystem. You can still see the effects today. Just look at these aerial images on the border with the Dominican Republic. On the Dominican side, you can see lush forests and green lands. On the Haitian side, the land is barren, trees gone. Back to the French colony of Saint-Domingue. By the end of the 18th century, the slaves had had enough. Not surprisingly, they revolted and made history. The revolution is something that all Haitians uh, are very proud of. I mean, it persists. I mean, this is one of the, uh, as we say in French, myth fondateur, you know, the founding myth. Uh, and it's one thing that keeps us going. In 1804, Haiti became the first black republic in the world. So far, so good. But it came with a price, a crippling one. First, isolation. Nobody wanted to do business with a new nation. The new Black Republic was cut off economically, surrounded by the colonies of powerful nations using slave labor who feared their slaves could also revolt. Haiti was the first Black Republic, reason enough for some of its powerful neighbors to refuse to even trade with a new nation because you know racism. And France? Republican revolutionary France demanded Haiti pay for its independence. 
Having lost its lucrative source of sugar, France sought reparations. A staggering sum of 150 million francs in gold. Over the next century, Haiti paid the equivalent of between 20 and 30 billion US dollars. With massive debt, how much of a chance did the Young Republic even have? After independence, Haiti suffered. From the burden of reparations, from isolation. But also from poor governments. A series of bad governments, leaders who added to the country's misery. I believe that there is such a thing as an opportunistic and ultimately detrimental convergence of interest between the Haitian rulers and the international community. The interest of the Haitians and the interest of the foreign powers is not necessarily the same, but the ultimate consequence of that convergence, opportunistic convergence, is that it is detrimental to the country. So both domestic and international factors have led to the devastating status quo in Haiti. A symbol for that is Cité Soleil. The densely populated neighborhood of Port-au-Prince is now in near complete control of gangs. Nearby is the Fontaine Hospital Center. In November 2023, a heavily armed gang stormed the hospital and threatened people inside. It's an environment of a really are, people are trying to, to survive and, and where violence is completely normalized right now. Diego Darin works at the International Crisis Group, a non-governmental organization committed to conflict resolution. He recently traveled to Haiti. The security situation rapidly deteriorated in July 2021. Back then, Haiti's president, Jovenel Moïse, was killed by Colombian mercenaries. It's unclear who paid them. The last time a Haitian president was killed was in 1915. That assassination opened a chapter of foreign intervention which still impacts Haiti today. That same year, U.S. Marines landed in Port-au-Prince. Officially, U.S. forces were there to restore order, but Washington also wanted to block European powers on the island from tapping into Haiti's resources. So we owed some money to uh, the U.S. banks, and the instability in Haiti gave a pretext to the United States to uh, move in with the Marines. And the first thing they did was to go into the central bank of uh, Haiti take uh, the reserves of the central bank, put it on a boat and send it back to New York to Citibank. And that's the way it was. U.S. troops stayed for 19 years, but their footprints are still visible today. What happened with the occupation was the centralization of power in Port-au-Prince. And the most important element was the creation of a centralized army, which became very much the arbiter of politics for a very long time uh, in Haiti. The U.S. occupation backed local elites and trained local security forces. Those forces would later back various regimes, including the brutal dictatorship of Francois Papa Doc Duvalier and his son Baby Doc. This led to a situation where Haitians became suspicious of power. And up until today, there is a vacuum of power, with Haiti edging closer to failed state status. A symbol for that, the National Palace. The official residence of the president was destroyed in Haiti's devastating earthquake in 2010. The ruins were even then removed and the palace never rebuilt. They have talked to rebuild, rebuild, but nothing has happened. Uh, the reconstruction that was promised never materialized. Uh, money was squandered, money was stolen. And again, foreign influence played its part. Maybe with good intentions, but again with a bad outcome for Haiti. Foreign powers wanted to bypass corrupt officials and gave their aid directly to NGOs. So the state became, you know, kind of a very weak structure. And people who were working in the state, they started moving into the NGOs. So when you have NGOs everywhere, no one controls them. The government loses its its essence, and once you have that, there is no, you know, so we've moved from a very despotic regime to a regime that has no control over anything. All this led to the situation today. No president, no functioning parliament, just the acting prime minister, Ariel Henry, with no real power. 
one of the worst crises Haiti has ever seen. That's why Henri has once again turned to the international community and asked the UN for help, yet another international player. For the moment, the missions of Onusian are very mal vues in Haiti. These missions are very, very mal vues in Haiti. The last time the United Nations intervened in Haiti, things went horribly wrong. This is Haiti's main water source, the Artibonite River. And this is precisely where the last UN mission took a devastating turn. In 2010, UN peacekeepers, mainly from Nepal, set up camp here, just above a stream flowing into the Artibonite River. A few days later, close by, suddenly the first cholera cases appeared. Investigations later found that the UN soldiers had unintentionally released infected sewage into the stream flowing into the Artibonite River, leading to a cholera outbreak that cost 10,000 lives and spread across the country. And there was never really any type of uh, restitution for those deaths. So there is a very bad taste in the, you know, in the... <laughs> In, in Haiti for that kind of intervention. The UN mission that was supposed to bring stability and security to Haiti left the country in 2017. So what does all of this mean for today? Has the world abandoned Haiti for good? And are Haitians even glad about it? Not quite. In 2022, the Prime Minister called for a new international security mission to come to Haiti to crack down on gang violence and lawlessness. Kenya has offered to lead a new UN-backed multinational mission that could soon deploy to Haiti. Il y a là pour, avec la police kenyane pour, au moment où je vous parle, on en a besoin. On en a besoin de pas et pas on en a besoin non. Les haïtiens, ils veulent une force étrangère parce que l'insécurité but a lot is still unclear. The UN and the Kenyans and the Americans, the Canadians and the French have said this is going to be a very different intervention. Now, I'm not quite sure that this necessarily is going to be a very different intervention. The idea is to send just a small group of highly trained police staff to restore order and secure key infrastructure, such as the country's main airport. So yes, now the international community is realizing that it must change the way it has acted and, and the way it has um, intended to help Haiti. But gangs control some 80% of Port-au-Prince. They are well armed and know the terrain. Even if international forces are welcomed at first, that could change quickly. So there might in fact be support for an intervention, but I think that support may be very short-lived if it is not a, a very effective intervention. In other words, they may welcome them, but if they can't establish order fairly quickly, I think the population would turn against them. For Haitians, the new mission raises once again the question, will it bring improvement or damage the country in the long run? A question with no answer yet, but Haitians have a resilient past to cling on to. I think we have a Bon, on le dit souvent, mais je pense qu'on a besoin d'un peu de conscience, de d'inspirer de, de, de nos aïeux, parce que on n'est pas sans savoir qu'on est la première république noire libre. On a, on a surmonté beaucoup de choses pendant ces 200 ans. Haiti clearly will face a number of problems for the foreseeable future. What do you think? Which geopolitical issue should we map out next? <laughs>